so today we're going to continue on a topic that we started on last time. We've been going through coverage testing and particularly path coverage testing, you may recall, the past several lectures. So we talked about state coverage versus transition coverage. Which of those offers greater levels of test assurance? Transition. Test coverage, yeah, transition coverage. And in general, we have a, a subsumption hierarchy in which certain levels of coverage, like edge coverage or transition coverage, uh, let's use that term equivalently, achieves automatically a level of coverage of things under it, node coverage. So everything that's covered by no coverage is, with a few basic assumptions, covered by edge coverage. And we examined, started examining last time, a higher level of coverage yet. We, we talked a bit about edge pair coverage, but our focus shifted to prime path coverage. And you may remember I put up some paths on the board to illustrate simple paths. And then I talked about prime paths being paths that are in some sense not divisible to any, they're, they're not composed of any smaller, um, smaller path. they're in some sense maximal paths. And we're going to come back to this. So we're going to talk about prime path coverage because it achieves a, a high degree of, um, of coverage compared to the other two, compared to even edge pair coverage and even as we'll see, round trip coverage, okay? So, just as a reminder, when we're trying to achieve coverage, regardless of whether it's even path coverage, we have to go through several steps and you're responsible for knowing these steps. Number one, you identify the things that you want to cover. Nodes, for example, in other words, states. Branches, for example or in this case, prime paths. Those are the things you want to hit. You want to cover them. You want to achieve coverage of them. Second of all, we're going to develop a set of abstract scenarios, so-called test paths, going from start to finish, to cover all the things we need to cover. These are abstract paths. Why do I say they're abstract here? Because um, they're not, they're just general kind of use cases for, yeah. for the system. That's good. And so when we say abstract, one of the things we typically mean is that it hides certain details. It doesn't get into certain details. Um, it, uh, it, it abstracts away from it. It sort of um, doesn't, uh, doesn't have to deal with certain details. And what are the details it doesn't deal with? Well, How the uh -huh. system is designed? No, no. In this case, it's the particular inputs that are going to achieve these paths. So you're going to say, I want to go this way. I want to go that way. And then, once we've identified that, we identify concrete test cases. These are particular types of particular inputs that are going to achieve those abstract paths. So each abstract path, you're going to figure out how do I make it go that way? What does the user have to enter here? What do they have to do in terms of this drop down? What do they have to do in terms of pressing buttons for it to go this way through the path, through the code, through the code or through the system, right? Because this, these approaches of path coverage can be applied at the code level, lower level code, or it can be applied at a high level. So we introduced this notion of prime path. And the notion of prime path built, built up some notions of, that were more fundamental in terms of a simple path. So what was a simple path? Who can remember? Isn't, isn't it like a path where like the only uh, repeating values are at the beginning and the end? Ones that can repeat. Can repeat. Right. Yeah, so it, it may or may not have repeating values. So, but if it has a repeating value, it has to be the first. You know, the first equals the last. Okay. Um, and uh, 
well, what is the Dharma? It won't have any repetition at all. If it does have any repetition, it has to be in this very constrained way where the start e- has to equal the finish. And the idea here is, look, given a, given a path that we have, we could take it apart into simple paths. Um, but there's a lot of different simple paths and things, starting at different points, ending at different points. So we define the notion of a prime path, which in some sense is a maximum length path. It's, it's prime path if it's not contained as a subpath of any other simple path. It is a simple path, but it's not just a piece of another path. It's, it's sort of as big as it can get. If it's really small, it might be contained as part of another one. But this is this is a big one. This is a, a maximum length path in some sense. Okay, does it get any any repetition of loops? If it got any bigger, would have repetition that that is illegal. So, so given graphs, here showed it's sort of uh, low level code. You know, here we have some nodes. We have some edges. And there's paths on that. And two prime paths in this diagram are this one and that one. How come N0, N2 isn't a prime path? Because it could go further. Could go further. And it's, in fact, contained in another simple path. N0, N2 is contained in what other simple path? N0, N2, N3? Yeah, precisely. So it's... And 0 and 2, is that a simple path? Yes. Yeah, that's a simple path. Is it a prime path? No. The two prime paths are these right here. Now, if we, uh, and similarly, we could here define prime paths. Here we have more prime paths. Give me one prime path here, just by, without even looking at these lower ones. And 0. Yeah, uh, good. And 0, and 1, and 3, and 4. Why, why not include N1 also? Because then it wouldn't be a what? It's not, a simple it's not even a simple path, much less a prime path. It's, it's not a simple path. Give me another one that's a, a prime path. It's uh, going straight down. Yeah, straight down. And 0, and 1, and 2. That's a, that's a prime path. Is it a simple path? Yep. Yeah. yeah. How do we know it's a simple path? Nothing's repeated at all. And it's a path, after all. We're following edges, right? Why do we say it's a prime path? Because it can't be contained in any other It's path. not contained in any other one um, that's, that's there. I mean, after all, if there was prime paths in this area, they'd have to, uh, they, they'd have to go through N1 and, and repeat uh, uh, and you know, this, uh, uh, this, they could start like N3, N4, N1, N2, but then it doesn't have N0. So, so that's right. And, and you'll notice there's a bunch of prime paths associated with this. Yeah, Mom? You're allowed to start at N3? Yeah. You can start anyway? Yeah, for prime paths, yes. Okay. Now, we're going to see test paths are more constrained. But yes, it's, it's, a, it's a salient point. So for example, other prime paths here are N3, N4, N1, N3, right? Yeah. Why can't it go further? Because it wouldn't be a, even a simple path. It wouldn't be a simple path. Why can't, why can't it just be N3, N4, N1? Why is that not? Okay, it can be contained in other paths is the key thing. So N3, N4, N1 could be contained, I would argue, in another simple path, which is N3, N4, N1, N3, amongst other things. Yeah? So, so you know, if it can be extended and still be a simple path, you know, uh, then, then it's not a prime path, for sure. So there's a bunch of prime paths here. But if we want to test it, if we want to plan test paths, these have to start at the, well, as Lewis Carroll said in Alice in Wonderland, you start at the start and you go to the 
and then stop. So you start at the start node and you go to a final node. Test paths, paths that take you through the program have to start somewhere you can start and they have to finish somewhere you can finish. So here they start at zero and one and two. That's a legitimate test path. Now watch this next one. Tell me about this one. This is a key one for testing your understanding. I would argue that this second one is a valid test path. And zero and one and three and four and one and three and four and one and then two. Is that a prime path? No. But it doesn't need to be. These are test paths. These are paths we could take. And what do they need to cover? All the prime paths. Collectively, these two have to achieve coverage of all the prime paths. It's not like the test paths are prime paths. They just have to achieve coverage of it. Just like in other cases, our test, our test paths had to achieve coverage of states or achieve coverage of transitions. Here, we're achieving coverage of prime paths. Does that make sense? So don't get caught up in... Well, we've got paths of one sort and paths of another sort. Look, we're trying to cover these prime paths with some test paths. The test paths don't have to be prime paths, but they have to cover them collectively. And these two could cover these collectively. This guy covers just one or several. It covers the, the whole swack of them, yeah. Does it cover, I think, all? I don't think it covers all but one, all but one which is covered by the other. Hmm? So these test paths achieve prime path coverage, right? Okay, so these are test paths, and these are sets of test paths that satisfy coverage requirements with respect to prime paths. In other words, they cover all the prime paths. Okay, now, here's the algorithm for building prime paths. You are responsible for this. Teams in this class have been known to implement this algorithm when reasoning about going through your system screen to screen and arguing that your tests collectively, the tests that will flow out of Jesse's keyboard in the fullness of time, hopefully with some help by others, that those tests will achieve coverage over the screens of your application. It's not a terribly hard thing. So the idea here is look, start with paths of length one. These are the nodes. Give me a path of length one in this graph. N zero. Okay, give me another one. N one. N one, another one, and three, and four, and two. All, all of those nodes, these are just the nodes, okay? And now what's gonna happen is we're gonna go, to go through a simple iteration procedure. We're gonna start at the first iteration. I is gonna count iterations. And we are going to accumulate a thing called PP, which somewhat uncharacteristically is actually not guaranteed to be prime paths. These are simple paths that are candidates to be prime paths. We're gonna throw some out at the end, okay? So watch this. We're going to have PP, and this is going to accumulate our candidates, and we're going to weed out ones that are not prime, that can be contained in others at the end. Okay, But in each iteration of this, we're going to have a value of i, which is going to count the current iteration, starts at 1. And we're going to have, going into this, a thing called p sub i, which in, for the first iteration is p sub 1. And what is p sub 1? I told you earlier, it's this guy here, path of like 1. And what's going to happen is we're going to go through this successively, successive iterations. And if we're on iteration i, we are considering paths of length i. So our first iteration, i equal 1, we're considering paths of length 1. Okay? Then as i gets incremented, we go into length 2. Or going to i equal 2, we're considering paths of length 2. And p sub i is going to hold those paths of length i. That's an invariant about this, this set. It contains, p sub i contains paths of length i. Okay? 
Um, variants are nice things to test, so I like to slip them in there. Okay, um, so the first thing, as we go through iteration I, the first thing we're going to do is, so we're considering these ones, we're going to basically sort out of these ones that are in P sub I, which are plausible candidates for, well, they're simple paths and they're candidates for being prime paths, okay? That's where we're going to, we're going to weed through P sub I and the ones that are plausible candidates, we're going to add into PP after passing through this thing R. Um, and those that are not plausible candidates for prime paths, we're going to extend our existing paths and add them to P sub I plus one. You know, because we're extending them. They're one long, longer than, instead of being length I, they're of length I plus one, hence they go on to P sub I plus one, okay? Okay, so watch this. Okay, we're, so we're going through, we're considering P sub I. Okay, first, you need to get the set of paths in P sub I that are cycles or that cannot be extended forward because they end at the terminal node or nodes. So this is a set of paths that are either cycles or can't be extended because they, they end in a terminal node. From the standpoint of simple paths, what unites that group? It sounds like two arbitrary groups, but what unites those? If you have a cycle, if one of P sub I is a cycle. Yeah. They can't be prime paths. They, yeah, they can't be extended, yeah. right? Why can't we extend a cycle? Like, it's no longer a simple path. Then it's no longer a simple path. Why can't we extend going forward something that ends at a terminal node? Because there ain't nothing there to extend it to, right? Yeah. You can't go further than that. It's kind of like a formal faculty member in our department. He did his PhD at a, a very strong computer science school called University of Texas at Austin. And he was m arranging to move back to Saskatchewan. And he later became head of the department, but he was just packing up, so he called a moving company. He had a family. And he had some furniture. So he said, uh, I need your help moving. And they said, well, where are you going to? He said, I'm going to Saskatchewan. They said, where's Saskatchewan? He said, well, it's in Canada. I said, well, where in Canada is it? And he told him, he said, it's north of North Dakota. The guy paused. He looked at a map. He said, I'm looking at a map here, sir, and there ain't nothing north of North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes you can't extend things because it's like the end. And, um, not to suggest Saskatchewan is the end, but it's um, uh, <laughs> but sometimes it's the last node in the train, right? So R is the set of things that can't be extended, yeah? And those things have a good candidate for being what? Simple paths. They are simple paths. Are they prime paths? Well, that remains to be seen. That remains to be seen. They're, they're, they're not, they're, they're legal. They're, they're either a straight line or they become a cycle with the start equal to the finish, or we would have gotten them earlier. So, so here are R is the set of paths that are simple paths. And we're going to take those paths, paths that can't be extended, that are good simple paths, and we're going to add them to PP here. These are candidates for being considered as prime paths. They're simple paths, maybe they're prime paths because they can't be extended any further. Right? Remember, prime paths are kind of maximum length paths that don't contain any repetition of loose. So these ones that we can't extend, they're good candidates for being prime paths, right? After all, if we can extend them, they ain't no prime paths. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so those that, that follow this category, they can't be extended further. They're they're simple and they are candidates for being prime paths. We add them into PP for consideration later. Meanwhile, we could take the rest of them, P sub I minus R. In other words, the rest that are not in R. In other words, the ones that, what? The ones that aren't prime paths? Well, it, the ones that can be extended. Yeah. yeah. 
ones that can be extended. Those are EP. Those are the extensible paths. You can extend them. And for each path in that group of length i, um, basically we're going to add to p of i plus 1, we're going to add to that path the next node. We know it's legal because we've already removed things that are cycles. So adding the next node that it can get to, or the next, of, of se maybe it has several nodes that it can get to next. Each of those gets added into p sub i plus 1. Yeah? So maybe it can go to any of two or three places, say three places. And for each of those three places, we add a path into p sub i plus 1. How long, how long are the paths going to be in p sub i plus 1? i plus 1. And so we're going to increment i and we're going to go back to the top. Hmm? Now this may seem like we'll go on ad nauseum. Perhaps it already seems that way. But in fact, what's going to happen is we're going to have fewer and fewer paths over time, as we're going to see. Because more and more can't be extended. And they're going to be in PP. At the end, PP contains all these candidates for being prime paths, and we're going to exclude from them any paths that are proper subpaths of another path. Why are we doing this? Why are we throwing out ones that are contained in other paths? Because they are prime paths. They ain't, they ain't no prime path if they're contained in another path, right? Another simple path, right? Remember they're Prime paths are in some sense, whoa, max, ooh, where, where am I? Um, maximum length paths. So it's not contained as a subpath. So anything that's a subpath ain't no prime path, right? And so we're throwing those out. And it gives us the prime paths when we throw this out. Okay, so let's consider this. Okay, here's length one. These are length one paths. What are these guys? Zero, one, two, three, four. Those are just the nodes, straightforward, right? This is like ease and light, if I asked you that in the final exam. Can yeah. say not six? Okay, so th this is what I'm about to describe. So the ones that are in green are paths that go into R. Why would they go into R? Do you remember this? Why do they go into R? Because they can't be extended. They can't be extended. And I show here with, actually this is from uh, this book, I show here with uh, exclamation point and star why they can't be extended. So uh, an exclamation point means it can't be extended because it's, it ends at a terminal node. So N6 can't be extended because there ain't nothing beyond that, right? Star can't be extended because it would create an illegal cycle. So for example, when we're at, l at length two here, we could go 4-4, four, four, but why can't we go on to 4-4-6, four, uh, four, four, for example? Three. Sorry? Because it's like 3 then? Uh, well... No, it's because you go 4-4 four, four and then something else. Doesn't that repeat something that's not the first and the last? Right, and so then it's not a simple path. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, not a sim it's not a prime path for sure, but even more basic, it's not a simple path. Because remember, a simple path, the definition of a simple path here is path from A to B is simple if it either contains no repeated nodes or if it does get a repeated node it has to be the case that the first is equal to last A equals B so 4 4 is that a simple path yeah. it's fine yeah the first is the same as the last 4 4 6 is that a simple path no because the first is not the same as the last but it does have repetition yeah so we this one is an example in like two which whoa, can't be uh, can't be extended. So star star and exclamation point indicate things that can't be extended. Okay. Now yes. So I have a question. The, the four loops on itself could mm -hmm. it theoretically be a prime path if it just continued to loop on itself over and over. You mean like n four n four n four n four? Yeah. Well, I mean it's not useful, but theoretically would it, it not be because you can you contain and four and four with exactly and four and four and four and four exactly four. It, it can only be the case the first equals the last you can't have interior ones that are the same okay yeah so so let's go through this just intuitively so length one that's these guys here length two where did these guys come from 
Where did like zero one come from? Where are all the arrows? Well, these are the things that get added into. This is p sub two, right? Mm -hmm. Here's p sub one. Here's p sub two, right? Um, how did things get added into p sub two? Well, it's the ones that can be extended that have been extended, right? So where did where did zero one come from? Extended. Austin was saying, yeah, it was extended from here, right? We consider where this can go next. It can go to one, so zero, one. Where else can it go? There are four. That's what this last little loop is. For each node, such that that one can go to it, add a path to p sub i plus two that is reflects the appending of the current one, which in case is zero, with the new one. Does that make sense? And the same thing with, for example, one, two. You can go to one, two, and one, five, right? Same thing with two, three. Same thing with three and one, right? Okay, now four and four, well, where did that four, four come from? Well, it extended four to this, right? It extended four to six, because it can be reached from that in five to six, okay? But now we're at length two, and these guys here, the ones in green, those are the ones that will be weeded out where? Where will those be weeded out? R. Yeah, in R. Those are the ones that can't be extended. And this shows why they can't be extended. So those get added into what? PP. Yeah, to, to the set of, of, of PP, the things that need to be... Um, uh, need to be considered for being prompt pass. But the others, they get extended, right? The other ones that aren't weeded out here are the extensible paths and they get extended. So this guy came from here. Then we add this guy who also came from there. This one came from here, right? Zero, four, six. Why isn't there a zero, four, four? It's already contained. It wouldn't be actually a, uh, a, 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 a simple path. Exactly, yeah. Um, and, uh, and then we have uh, one, two, three, et cetera. And then these guys get weeded out because why, why do these guys get weeded out? Like zero, four, six. Terminal. They're terminal node, hence, hence the exclamation point. They get weeded out and the others get we attempt to add them in, but most can't be be added in at all. Um, and uh, so, for example, um, uh, here we, we're going to have uh, uh, 0, 1, 2. So if we have 0, 1, 2, for example, you might think then we could have 0, 1, 2, 3, right? Um, so for each path in there, that's an extensible path, um, then then we should be able to do that. Yes. There's well, something I don't get. Yes. Zero one five. Yes. Yes, it should be what? able to be. Why isn't there yeah, zero yeah. one five? Yeah. Yeah. This is what I've realized is, and this is a, a typo thing on my part. This is is this length four? It was like length five. five. There's actually a missing column. Okay. Here, where where we have this, okay, I just didn't okay. put it. That's but fine. the point is, it weeds down. It weeds down. So yeah, this should yeah. actually say length five here yeah um so good call uh it, it weeds and basically more and more get weeded out yeah, yeah they get extended but they get weeded out and and then we have uh we have ones that uh that basically successively get put into here and then we weed out the ones in this in pp we throw away the ones that are subpass of others right so we get out these as the prime pass okay now we can cover these with a set of test paths. So 0, 1, 5, 6, 0, 1, 5, 6, for example, together with 0, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 5, 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 5, 6. These will cover you know, several and then 0, 4, 6, we'll cover 
So 0, 4, 6 will cover others and 0, 4, 4, 6. These are perfectly legitimate test paths. What's distinctive about these? Where do they start? Uh, test paths start at the start. at a legitimate start point and they go to a legitimate, legitimate endpoint. Mm -hmm. But they collectively, I would argue these cover these guys. Yeah. If you have two terminal nodes, then you just have more paths, right? Um, correct. So yeah. Just yep. Mm. You can have more terminal like nodes. That's fine. Came to seven, like exactly. Came yeah. If there was one that went here, like these are two different return values yeah, or so something. Yep. Ways. Yep. You could have that. Okay. So these are prime paths. Now, um, prime paths then need to. So so you found them, right? This is all about just finding the prime paths. Um, now, once you find them. That's great. Now we know the set of things we need to cover, right? We've located them. Great. That's the first step. Then we have to figure out a set of paths that will cover them. That's what I just said. You know, these abstract paths from start to finish that will cover them. And finally, we've got to figure out how to get those paths to go the right way with particular input, right? To get it to go left here, right there, what have you, to take the first statement, the consequent of the if or the alternative of the if. Does that make sense? Okay, um, so we have to find uh, test paths, and then, um, you know, commonly a test path that covers one prime path will cover others. Great. Uh, and, uh, you know, to find feasible covering test paths, sometimes you extend the longest path backwards and forwards, but fundamentally you come up with test paths that go from start to finish, fr from a legitimate start to a legitimate finish, and then you gotta find concrete input, which will exercise them. So Jesse has to come up with input, user input, for example, or arguments to the function calls, right? That, that will cover this, like uh, the call sum, what they will get it to go that way, right? Mm -hmm. So why are we concerned about, like, like why talk about this? Because prime path coverage is really very strong. Achieving prime path coverage is much stronger than edge coverage. It's much stronger than node coverage. It's stronger than edge pair coverage. It may look kind of arbitrary, but it's been shown, it's been proven that this is really a very strong testing technique. If you're testing the prime paths, you're doing well compared to just testing edges or just testing nodes. You're really exercising kind of the ways the program can do in a much more significant way. You can do this at a lower level of statements, or you could do it at a higher level of screens of your app. I would love it if you could do it at the screen level for the Cards app. But that will be something that you will have to see if you can do, okay? So that's prime pass. Now, it's not the only path, the only way of doing strong things. There's also this other set of options, round trip coverage. Um, and, and with round trip coverage, we kind of go through a flow here and we basically stop it when we've hit a round trip, when we've reached a cycle. Where have we reached a cycle here? We go A, B, C, if we consider A the input. Where do we reach a cycle? Suppose we come down this way. B. Yeah, we go, we all come all the way back to B. And that's why you end at B here. That's why these say B, because you've hit a cycle. So this is another way you can figure out paths to try. You want to try this. You want to try this. These are different round trips that you can make. But let me ask this, from this diagram, ooh, this would be a nice exam question. Or even a quiz question. Too late for today, but maybe for next time. Ooh, that would be interesting. Which, which is stronger here? Prime path coverage or these round trip coverage variants? Prime path. Prime path. Ladies and gentlemen, prime paths early, prime paths often. These will test, it look, may look weird, it may look a bit arcane, but it will test your program in really significant ways. So I would suggest trying to apply them 
and I will view that highly. Maybe not necessarily for ID3, although I find it, but, but at least some ID would be great. Think about it, okay? And of course, it could be done at this level as well. The level in particular, if you have a sort of gnarly algorithm that Mo creates, you could actually apply it at this level and reason about prime pass here. It's a little bit of grinding, but it's not too bad. And within an hour, you could have your prime pass and, and, and then Jesse, your other testers, to admirably help him, other than four people from my lab, will uh, we'll be able to test this, right? Yeah. Um, so I would suggest, look, um, functional tests, functional tests are often designed, you're thinking about testing the system through certain functions, and you're often thinking about use cases that will take it to certain screens. But I would argue that often those functional tests could be used to test at the code level, you know, what, what sides of this if statement are being tested? What's actually being reached in this? And Jay's support for Istanbul in terms of comment level and branch level coverage will be quite good. So you should be reasoning about coverage at the code level as well. Okay. But this is not the full extent of coverage testing. We've been talking about coverage testing. It took us in a whirlwind tour of node coverage, transition coverage, round trip coverage, prime path coverage. But now I'd like to introduce you briefly, but significantly to a different sort of coverage testing. And this sort of coverage testing is not path coverage testing. It is something called logic testing or logic coverage testing. I'd like to motivate it. There's a lot of systems where what you're doing or where you reach within the system is governed by logical possibilities. An example here is associated with adjustable seats in a car, for example, and, and or, or other buttons in a car. Um, and uh, you know, here you have seat backs, you have seat adjustments, side mirrors, and seat buttons, and so on. And there are these different states, like if the ignition is on. Um, you know, you might do one thing, and, and if the ignition is off, you'll handle different things. How it responds to your request might be different, okay? Um, maybe it doesn't allow you to adjust your seat while you're driving, like in the middle of driving, mm. uh, for safety reasons, uh, for example. Um, or it doesn't allow you to adjust, the, turn on the ignition or turn off the ignition while you're driving, which could lead to adverse consequences. Um, so logic testing can be quite useful to for testing your system. Sometimes they're highly based on logical conditions. What would be a logical condition that might affect your system? It's either true or false and it's some high level thing. Online? Yeah, are you online? Are you connected or not? Could that affect the functionality of your system? Big time, big time. And yet, when we've been discussing paths, we've abstracted away from what conditions will take us different ways. Some combinations of paths are impossible due to logical conditions. I talked about this the other day, do you remember? Where there was one path for EU resident or US, US or EU resident and then this other one, we said, oh, this is an abstract path in red, but in fact, it's logically inconsistent because here we're positing we're a ES, US or EU resident, and here we're assuming we're not. And the point is we've been, for the most part, abstract away from what conditions will cause it to go the, the right way. And for your screens and your app, maybe 
there's certain screens you only get to if you're online. Or there's only certain screens you only get to if you're offline. Warning you about this or, or what have you. And, and here, in addition to testing where you reach in the code, you might want to be testing are the right things undertaken at the right, under the right conditions when this is the case, when we are offline and this is a new user, what happens? When we're offline, you know, and the user requests this, what happens or what have you. So I argued before that sometimes at the lower code level, there are conditions logically which, um, which obtain. So here, you know, if A is greater than B, we'll go this way. Otherwise, we'll go that way here. If A is less than B, and there's only so many ways we can go through here. So, so let's suppose if, this, if the predicate is true, this, this full predicate, okay? Suppose I go to the right, otherwise I go to the left, okay? So here I'm going to the right if this is true. Come down here. Could I again go to the right here? No. no. DF, no. We know if we went this way, there's no way I can go this way. And when we're dealing with abstract paths, oh yeah, sure, we can go this way. We'll come up with, we're gonna assign Jesse to come up with a you know, with a, with a set of conditions, a set of input will cause it to go this way. No way, Jose, it's just not gonna work out. It's not gonna work, okay? Um, okay, so with structural logic coverage, we're not dealing with paths. We're dealing with conditions. What logical conditions to test the system in? And here, we're going to be trying to get it to test those conditions, get it to the place where the test occurs, and then determine how to get it to test that condition, how to get it into that state to test that condition. Now, it turns out that there's a hierarchy here, a subsumption hierarchy, in terms of levels of logical testing. Just like prime path coverage is strictly stronger than Transition coverage, which is strictly stronger than what? Node. Node coverage or state coverage, and we use those interchangeably, just like edge and transition coverage we use interchangeably. Just as in those subsumption hierarchy we have for path coverage, so we have this subsumption hierarchy here. Okay. And here People have derived you know, really rigorous ways of testing it. We're only gonna talk about the most basic. We're gonna talk about the most basic to talk about limitations, okay? Things that might not be obvious at first blush, but why these are each limited. You'll notice it's kind of interesting. Which of these is stronger, clause coverage or predicate coverage? It's a trick question. Yeah, neither are stronger than the other. Neither are stronger than the other. We, we can't say if we do clause coverage, we automatically cover predicate coverage, nor can we say the reverse. They're, they're different types of coverage, but neither guarantees the other. Does that make sense? So subsumption hierarchy. And again, as you go up here, it's more complete coverage, okay? so. Just a bit of, of basic terminology here. And I'm, I'm only gonna give a glimpse of this today. It's possible I'm gonna go over the syllabus where we're at and so on, go over your where, state of where you're at in your projects and figure out how much we go into this further next time. Or if we move on to a different topic that might be more highly prioritized. But basically, we're gonna introduce some basic terms this, this lecture I want you to know. One is predicate coverage, or one is the notion of a predicate versus a clause. Did you encounter the term predicate in <coughs> other courses, like 260? Yeah, probably. Who did you have for 260, Mark Kyle? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I saw him just y yonder. I saw him yeah. walk through the lab. Um, uh, he's awesome to have, to help you if, if, if you get a chance. Anyway, um, so, we're gonna distinguish here between a clause, which is a, 
Basically, it, it is a predicate. It's, it's some logical expression. It evaluates to Boolean, but it's a simple one. It doesn't include logic operators. What do I mean by a logic operator? Give me an example of a logic operator. Yes. And, yeah, actually, logic operators are things that take in as input true or false values. So, so actually, equals will... Um, well, I, I could imagine a case where it's operating in Booleans, but if we're dealing with real numbers with, with doubles or with uh, integers, it, it wouldn't qualify. But what, what would be another one? And? Or. Or, NAND, NOT, ZOR, etc. right? So these are predicates without Booleans. And these are examples of clauses. X is greater than zero. E is less than D plus C. F is less than or equal to G. By contrast, a predicate is something that also evaluates to a Boolean, but predicates in general, just not clauses, can include logical operators. They can have ors or ands. So what is this one saying here? Uh, A is greater than B, or C, C, I'm assuming that's like a function C, or is it just a value? No, it could just be a value. So it could be True or value, yeah. Yeah. So under what cases would this be true? Give me give me a couple enumerations of cases under which B this of X is true. Okay. And C is true. Okay, or C is true. Is there another possibility and where P of X is not? It has to be and true. Ah. Okay. Both yeah. Like one part of A. Yes, is indeed. This is an and. So so P of X is true and C is true. Would that be true? If P of X is true and C is false, is it still possible it's true? No. Yes. Oh, yeah. If A and B, A greater than B is yeah, true. Yeah, if this yeah. is true. Okay. Um, so that's that's good. Um, and we can come up, you know, with other other cases of these things. But you got to think through, okay, well, under what cases would it be true and false? And the idea here is we're going to try to test this to make sure that it does the right things under different combinations of values, okay? It's not that we want to check that it evaluates the right value, no. We want to check that the system does the right thing. So, for example, when it goes offline and the user is a new user, that it does the right thing. Or it goes offline, the user is not a new user, that it does the right thing. We, we want to check it in a, a requisite level of thoroughness that we're confident it's working. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm gonna introduce the two things whoa, at the bottom of this hierarchy. One is predicate coverage. The idea here is we're gonna be looking at situations where we have at least one case where we're testing it where this whole thing is true and one case where it's, wanna guess it? false yeah so it's the whole predicate the whole predicate we want to have one case where it's true one where it's false now give me one where it's true you did earlier give me just remind me c and p of x good give me one where it's false p of x is false p of x is false Give me another where it's false. Uh, a is less than B, and, or and C is false. And C is false, yeah. So there's a lot of ways we can make it false, a lot of ways we can make it true. And as a result, we're not testing thoroughly those conditions. We're just testing one where it's true, one where it's false, right? Um, it's a little bit like state coverage. Remember with state coverage, we didn't care how we got there, just that we reached a state. There might be many ways we could have gotten to that state, but we're only testing, we only need to test one of them to achieve state coverage. It's kind of a, a poor version of state coverage, or a poor version of coverage. We only have to do one way and we say, hey, we're done. We can't, the ticket is canceled. Maybe we're only testing Ticket is canceled because the you know mechanical difficulties, but 
we never test because the user requested it. If we're not testing that, you know, how, how thorough can our testing be? So predicate coverage is weak. Ladies and gentlemen, weak. So here's some examples of, you know, we're, we're achieving. Is it going to be true here or false? True. It's going to be true. C and P of X. Is this going to be true or false? False. False. Okay. So another form of coverage that we might try to cover is clause coverage. Now with clause coverage, what are we doing? Well, for each clause, we're going to cover at least one case where it's true and where it's false. Okay. So let's take a look at, at this, this here. We're going to have at least one case where what is true? for clause coverage. A is greater than B. And we're also going to include the case where it's what? False. false. A is greater than B is false. For C, we're going to test at least one case where it's true, true and, false. and false. P of X, at least one case where it's true, at least one case where it's false. Now, do you think that's going to be stronger than predicate coverage? Uh, no. it so you're, you're correct. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Can you go back? Yeah. Um, this is it doesn't care about the combinations, correct? Correct. It just cares about... Right. Okay. At least one... So, yeah. What would be really exhaustive testing? Testing the combination. combinations where you know a greater than b, you have all possible combinations of these, right? So each of these has two possible values. How many combinations would there be? Two, 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 to, the, two to the three, sorry. Two to the three. Yeah. Two, well, to the two to the third, which is eight. which is eight. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then in general, it'd be two to the i, where i is the number. Yeah, of. that's exactly right. Now that may not be prohibitive you might think sure just run it through these eight and i'd be i would be awesome if jesse gives me his test cases and he does all eight awesome the challenge is if these things are kind of kind of hard like they involve physical configurations of virtual machines or you got to get it into a mode where it's offline versus off you know online it may be fairly burdensome to undertake these things manually and doing all eight is it's a lot of work. Or if you have, you know, 10 different conditions, 10 different logical considerations, you get two to the 10th, 1024, it starts to become kind of burdensome, right? So, so clause coverage, you might think it's more, it's stronger. You might be excused for thinking it's stronger. There's certainly more moving parts with it, right? You're testing this true or false, this true or false, this true or false seems like there's uh, there's um, some strength there but the problem is it, you're not linking it to the change in predicate it's like you you might achieve class coverage without doing what doing predicate coverage yeah without without changing the value of the predicate without in fact changing it and so here let's let's consider this so we're going to achieve clause coverage in this way. I would argue, well, you tell me, do these two cases achieve clause coverage? Yeah. yeah. Uh, how do we know that? Because the first one is covered by the A and B. The second one's covered by C being true and false. They made everything true in the first one and everything false. Everything true in the first one, everything false in the second one. Right. Now. Do these two change the value of the predicate? No. Yeah, yeah, it actually does change the value of the predicate. This guy here, P of X is true. Is this guy true in this first one? In, yeah, it is, because C is true as well. And this guy is true. So the predicate is true here. Is it true here? 
No, it's false. So it actually does, in this case, achieve predicate coverage. But could you imagine doing something like this where it does not change it? Yeah, yeah. So, so here we can actually look at these things. So if we have something like, if we consider a situation where you have A, a you know, clause A and clause B, and we're considering A or B, we could achieve predicate coverage with this guy here and this guy here. So two and four, the ones colored in, in blue here. What if I not, why do I say that's kind of weak testing? What has not happened? If I consider test case two and four, what have I not done? Tested if B is true. Yeah, I haven't, yeah, tested even one case where B is true. Just kept B false. So I mean, how serious could I be about testing it? Conversely, let's consider clause coverage. That's that's the the sort of pink one here, right? Here's clause coverage. Um, why do I say that two and three achieve clause coverage? Because they have A true and false and B true and false. Yeah, each of A and B are examined with true values with false values. But did they achieve predicate coverage? No. Mo, I think, said it earlier that if, if this had been an or, yeah. you might not achieve predicate coverage, you know, even as you achieve clause coverage. So ideally, we'd like to have, and I think this was asked earlier by Mo, and, and you know, Jesse was commenting on it too, we'd ideally like to have all possible ones, right? This is combinatorial coverage for each possible, you know, has, has criteria for all possible values. Generally, that's in, in well, in, in, in some cases, in many cases, it's infeasible where it's, imagine that for a, um, you know, for a, for this, it might be really awkward to put the car into these various things and have it, you know, with the ignition on and the engine on and all these sort of things. But there are cases where it is possible. In another lecture, and in some lectures I've given in the past, I might further talk about these, which are basically good approximations for these. And they're very clever. Basically, they involve changing the value of clauses in such a way that we're still guaranteed to change the value for predicate. We're still guaranteed to try at least some cases where predicate is true, some cases where it's false, while still achieving clause coverage. Okay? I'm not going to cover this all today. It's too much to go into. Is yeah. it possible to do complete like, clause coverage for, like, let's say, admin privileges only? Yeah. That would be worthwhile. Do people do that in the industry? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in order to test... And at a basic level of, of, of thoroughness, sure. I mean, uh, manual tests, but also automated tests, ideally. You could just run it through. I mean, it's, it's quite common to have thousands of tests in industry for certain products. Not all products. There are certain sub-industries which are quite poor at testing. I think I've mentioned one before. What's, what's one that does not make use of too much rigorous testing? VR. Sorry? VR. Yeah, VR... VR traditionally is harder to test, and also the entertainment industry, the game industry, is just not typically into testing. Um, I don't know if you people have taken uh, 306. Yeah. Did you? Um, Kevin Stanley doesn't teach anymore, does he? No, it's Jason. G oh, uh, okay. Um, that's interesting. So, um, so Kevin used to show a video of you know various video game bugs which showed, um, uh, you know, weird things that can happen in video games. And video game companies are just not really into a lot of heavy, heavy testing, partly because their customers are pretty forgiving. Uh, they're, they're doing it for fun. They tend to be power users. Uh, you know, they'll kind of say, what the hell, you know. 
Um, you know, why is that guy running around without his head? You know, that's weird. Um, and they might even share how to do it, you know, just, <laughs> just, just for kicks. But there's other industries that are, there's many industries which are extremely careful about testing. And, um, you know, desktop software is, is, is very well tested. It's, you know, it's not a common to have thousands of, of lines of, of, of thousands of tests tests which are testing it and yes testing it with different configurations for admin permissions or whatever is pretty important it's important for security right for, for chief of security okay so um, again I could go into these higher levels of coverage but I think I'm going to drop that right now and let you folks prepare last time I let you prepare at the beginning of class and that took some some time so I want to give you plenty of time I will come back uh, at uh, here at four o'clock sharp, and if we could start then, that'd be great. If you could be all hitched up, that'd be great. I have this on HDMI mode. Okay, so uh, good. Do you have HDMI on your laptop? I'll just have to.